The Battle of Marengo stands as a pivotal moment within the broader narrative of Bonaparte's Italian campaign of 1800, a campaign characterized by audacity, strategic maneuvering, and shifting fortunes. It was a culmination of Bonaparte's bold move across the formidable barrier of the Alps with his Army of the Reserve, led officially by Louis Alexander Berthier. The timing of Bonaparte's crossing in mid-May 1800 was daring as it occurred before the passes were fully navigable, underscoring his commitment to seizing the initiative. The crossing not only showcased Bonaparte's military prowess but also strategically threatened the Austrian lines of communication in northern Italy. By swiftly advancing, Bonaparte's forces seized key cities such as Milan, Pavia, Piacenza, and Stradella, effectively cutting off the main Austrian supply route along the south bank of the Po River. This series of conquests not only bolstered French control in Lombardy but also put pressure on Austrian positions throughout the region. Bonaparte's calculated strategy included leveraging the siege of Genoa, commanded by General André Messina, to divert Austrian attention and resources away from countering his offensive movements. However, the surrender of Genoa on June 4 freed up substantial Austrian forces, altering the dynamics of the conflict. The Battle of Montebello on June 9, where General Jean Lons achieved a decisive victory over Feldmarschall Lieutenant Peter Ott, initially bolstered Bonaparte's confidence. He began to believe that the Austrians, led by General Michael von Mailas, would not mount a significant counterattack and might even retreat. Encouraged by his successes and perhaps overly confident in the face of Austrian maneuvers, Bonaparte pressed forward, expecting the enemy to yield further ground. Meanwhile, other French forces converged from the west and south, further complicating the Austrian position. Melas, recognizing the shifting dynamics, made the strategic decision to consolidate his forces in Alessandria along the main turin mantua road, abandoning positions near Nice and Genoa. Thus, the stage was set for the fateful encounter at Marengo, where Bonaparte's assumptions would be challenged, and the true test of his leadership would unfold in the heat of battle. The Austrians devised a plan to maneuver eastward while employing a local double agent, François Tolly, to deceive Bonaparte. Under the guise of this agent, they aimed to mislead Bonaparte into believing that they would attempt a northern march, crossing the Po River to reach Milan, while converging with reinforcements from Genoa. The spy advised Bonaparte to march via sail on the northern side of the plain, positioning himself to engage the Austrian left wing, while the main Austrian force would move through Marengo village in the center, then turn north to flank the French left. Upon Ott's arrival from Montebello on June 13, a war council was convened where senior Austrian generals strongly endorsed this plan. They deemed it preferable to retreating along the river Pa, which would have resulted in ceding Piedmont to the enemy without a fight. However, by relinquishing control of the San Giuliano Plain, where the superior Austrian cavalry could have provided an advantage, Melas likely committed a significant error. Meanwhile, Bonaparte, aware that Ott was trapped in Alessandria but uncertain of Mela's exact whereabouts, took precautions. Following his encounter with the spy and fearing a potential Austrian escape, Bonaparte deployed his forces strategically. He dispatched Louis de Sakes with Divisional General Jean Boudet's division south to Novi Ligure and Divisional General Jean Francois Cornu de la Poipe north on the opposite bank of the Pa. Further north, divisions under Antoine de Bethencourt and Joseph Chabran were stationed from Vercelli to Lake Maggiore, while Jean Thomas Guillaume Lorge's division was positioned north of Piacenza. Bonaparte's suspicions were confirmed when General Claude Victor Perrin, supported by Divisional General Joachim Murat's cavalry, swiftly expelled FML Andreas O'Reilly von Ballenlach's Austrian brigade from Marengo village. Victor then deployed divisions under Gaspard Amadi Gardin and Jacques Antoine de Chamberlac de Lobspin along the Fontenone stream. Although Austrian headquarters contemplated constructing a bridge to the north to outflank the French, logistical constraints, including a shortage of pontoons and time, compelled them to cross the river Bormida instead. They subsequently launched a single, direct assault across the Fontenone bridge. The battlefield east of Alessandria was characterized by a vast plain intersected by the winding Bormida River, where the Austrians established a strategic bridgehead. Scattered across the plain were numerous hamlets and farms, each representing crucial tactical positions. The primary locations of the impending battle formed a triangle, Marengo to the west, Castelciriolo to the north, and San Giuliano Vecchio to the east. A small stream, the Fontenone, flowed between Marengo and the Bormida. 
Napoleon, positioning his headquarters at Tori Garofoli to the east, oversaw the strategic maneuvers from this vantage point. The Austrians initially fielded 30,000 troops and 100 artillery pieces while facing off against 22,000 French soldiers and their 15 guns. However, with the subsequent arrival of de Sakes and his 6,000 reinforcements, the balance shifted in favor of Bonaparte's forces. By March 1800, the Austrian army in Italy had been depleted by casualties and disease, with some regiments reduced to as few as 300 men. The bulk of their forces were concentrated in Piedmont and the adjacent Pavalli, with only limited units deployed to better supplied regions for winter quarters. Difficulties in troop transport resulted in only a fraction of reinforcements reaching the field army, leaving it scarcely larger than at the conclusion of the previous campaign. Efforts were made to upgrade equipment and uniforms, though implementation was incomplete by 1800. Melas divided his army into three corps positioned along the Bormida River, with Ott commanding the northern advance guard, O'Reilly von Ballenlach in the south, and Melas himself overseeing the center. In contrast, the French forces, having suffered similar hardships in 1799, underwent significant reorganization under Bonaparte's leadership. The establishment of the Army of the Reserve prioritized revamping the supply system to ensure regular provisions and improved uniforms for the troops. The Corps of Bonaparte's Reserve comprised 30,000 men, largely from the Batavian Republic, supplemented by veteran troops from various sources. The new military doctrine emphasized offensive tactics, mobility, and the decisive use of the bayonet. On the battlefield, the French deployed their forces strategically, with Victor's corps stationed in and south of Marengo, supported by Kellerman's cavalry on the left flank. Lon's corps positioned northeast of Marengo, while Magnier's division, supported by the guard, held the eastern flank near Castel Siriolo, forming the reserve. Victor's corps, anticipating the brunt of the Austrian assault, stood poised to confront the enemy's advance. As the Austrian attack unfolded, General Michael von Melas led the center of the army, believing erroneously that the battle was nearing its conclusion before the arrival of de Sakes. The Austrian troops advanced eastward from Alessandria, crossing the Bormida River via two bridges situated in a narrow bend, rendering the river difficult to cross elsewhere. However, poor staff work hindered the rapid development of their attack, forcing the entire army to funnel through a narrow bridgehead. The Austrian advance commenced around 6 a.m., with the first shots fired approximately two hours later. However, it wasn't until 9 a.m. that the attack fully developed. The Austrian advance guard, under Colonel Johann Maria Philipp Fremont and a division led by FML O'Reilly, engaged the French outposts, pushing them back and establishing the Austrian right wing. This force drove the enemy from Pedrabona Farm before turning southward to confront the French at La Stortiglione Farm. Simultaneously, the Austrian center, comprising roughly 18,000 troops under Melas, pressed forward toward Marengo. They were met with resistance from General de Division Gardin's French infantry, deployed in front of the Fontenone stream. On the Austrian left, FML Peter Ott's contingent of 7,500 men awaited clearance to advance toward Castel Siriolo, threatening either an envelopment of the French right or a disruption of their communication lines with Milan. Gardin's division valiantly held off the Austrian advance for a significant period. When exhaustion set in, Victor withdrew the division behind the Fontenone and committed his second division under General de Division Chamberlain. However, Chamberlain's nerve faltered, and he soon fled the battlefield. The French managed to maintain control of Marengo village and the Fontenone line until around noon, despite being vulnerable on both flanks. In the center, Melas launched successive attacks with divisions under FML Karl Joseph Haddock von Futak and FML Konrad Valentin von Kaim, both of which were repelled by the entrenched French positions. Melas then dispatched FML Ferdinand Johann von Morzen's elite grenadier division to assault Marengo village. Additionally, Melas made a critical tactical error by detaching General Major Nimpsch's brigade to counter a perceived threat from General Louis Gabriel Suchet's corps, which was mistakenly reported to be approaching from the south. Meanwhile, Napoleon, stationed approximately five kilometers away from Marengo, initially misinterpreted the Austrian activity as a diversionary tactic. It wasn't until around 10 a.m. that he recognized the gravity of the situation and began mobilizing his forces in support of Victor's corps. 
Lon's corps deployed on the vital right flank, with reinforcements crossing the Fontenot north of Marengo to engage Austrian forces. Napoleon urgently recalled detached units and summoned his last reserves to bolster the French right flank. By noon, Lons adjusted his forces to face General Major Friedrich Joseph Anton von Belgard's column, while Kame renewed his assault against Victor's wings. The Fontenone was bridged, and Austrian grenadiers crossed to engage French defenses in Marengo village. Despite brief French counterattacks, the Austrians made significant gains, capturing Stortiglione and Castel Siriolo by early afternoon. As the French retreated, Austrian troops crossed the Fontenone, bombarding the retreating infantry. In a desperate bid to delay the Austrian advance, Bonaparte committed his main guard battalion and artillery, though they were ultimately overwhelmed and destroyed by Fremont's cavalry. With the French forced back approximately three kilometers and unable to hold their defensive positions, the battle appeared to be tipping in favor of the Austrians. Melas, slightly wounded, relinquished command to his chief of staff, General Anton von Zach, and came. The Austrian center formed a pursuit column to drive the French off the battlefield, with delays in the flanks resulting in a crescent-shaped formation. Despite these challenges, the Austrians pressed forward, albeit with O'Reilly's right wing and Ott's left wing operating at a distance from the main body due to logistical issues and French resistance. As the French found themselves in a dire situation, General de Sakes, commanding the detachment Bonaparte had sent southward, hastened his advance and reached a key road junction north of Casina Grossa, just three kilometers west of San Giuliano. Close to 5 p.m., de Sakes personally reported to Bonaparte, revealing that his force of 6,000 men and nine guns from Boudet's division was not far behind. In a moment of grim assessment, de Sakes famously remarked to Bonaparte, this battle is completely lost. However, there is time to win another. Swiftly, the French deployed the fresh troops in front of San Giuliano, while the Austrians were slow to mount their attack. Boudet and the 9th Light Infantry Regiment were promptly moved to the exit from the main vine belt, surprising the head of St. Julian's Column. As the Austrian infantry deployed on the south side of the road, the 9th Light Infantry conducted a steady withdrawal, drawing the Austrians into de Sakes's position. There, General de Brigade Louis Charles de Ganan's brigade was positioned on the north side, while the remaining French forces under Magnier and Lons formed up to the north. Austrian artillery batteries were deployed on the north side of the road, supported by a dragoon regiment. Marmont marshaled the remaining French cannon against the advancing Austrians. Boudet's division advanced in a line of brigades against the head of the Austrian column, initially defeating St. Julian's leading brigade. General Anton von Zach brought forward General Major Latterman's Grenadier Brigade and renewed the attack. In a critical moment, Napoleon sent de Sakes forward once again, ordering a cavalry charge as requested by de Sakes. As the 9th Light Infantry halted to face the main Austrian advance, Marmont's guns unleashed grapeshot at close range, causing significant casualties. Amidst the chaos, Kellerman's heavy cavalry charged Latterman's formation on its left flank, causing it to disintegrate. At this decisive moment, de Sakes was shot from his horse. Morat and Kellerman swiftly routed the supporting Liechtenstein dragoons, while the fleeing Austrian horsemen disrupted Pilates' troopers. As the Austrian infantry lost heart and began retreating, pursued by French cavalry, the entire Austrian line advanced westward. Despite a valiant last defense mounted by Fremont and others around Marengo village, the Austrian center managed to retreat behind the safety of the Bormida River under the cover of night. Ott's left flank, however, found its retreat blocked by advancing French troops, but eventually fought their way back to the Bormida bridgehead. The Austrians retreated into Alessandria, having suffered heavy losses. In the intense 12 hours of battle, they lost 15 colors, 40 guns, nearly 8,000 prisoners, and 6,500 dead or wounded. French casualties amounted to approximately 4,700 killed and wounded, with 900 missing or captured. Despite the losses, the French retained control of the battlefield and maintained the strategic initiative. De Sakes's body was discovered among the fallen, a testament to his sacrifice in the heat of battle. With urgency pressing and the need to depart for Paris looming, Bonaparte dispatched Berthier on a surprise visit to Austrian headquarters the following morning after the battle. Remarkably, within a mere 24 hours of the intense conflict at Marengo, Melas initiated negotiations, culminating in the Convention of Alessandria. 
This diplomatic agreement resulted in the Austrians evacuating northwestern Italy west of the Ticino River and temporarily halting military operations in the region. The triumph at Marengo solidified Bonaparte's position as first consul, bolstering his authority and prestige. This victory provided a significant boost to his image and political standing. It marked a pivotal moment where Bonaparte's leadership and strategic acumen were validated on the battlefield. His success contrasted sharply with the failures of previous French generals like Scherer, Joubert, Championnet, and even Moreau, none of whom had managed to deliver a decisive blow to the coalition forces. Moreau's victory at Hohenlinden, although significant, was overshadowed by Bonaparte's achievement at Marengo. From this point onward, Bonaparte skillfully positioned himself as the savior of the Republic, rejecting overtures from Louis XVIII and solidifying his role as the driving force behind France's future. The Battle of Marengo was not only a military victory but also a propaganda triumph for Bonaparte's regime. Mythologized in army bulletins and official reports, Marengo became a symbol of French resilience and military prowess. Tales were spun about the heroic actions of units like the Guard and the 72nd Demi Brigade, enhancing the narrative of French triumph against overwhelming odds. Key figures such as General Francois Kellerman were celebrated for their contributions to the victory. Melas himself acknowledged the impact of Kellerman's charge, attributing it to the collapse of Austrian morale. Murat echoed this sentiment, emphasizing the decisive role played by Kellerman's bold maneuver. However, in official accounts, Bonaparte sought to balance the credit, highlighting other actions such as Bessières's charge to portray a more comprehensive narrative of French success. Even in the aftermath, efforts were made to shape the narrative of the battle. Berthier's account, published in 1804, attempted to justify the retreat maneuver as a strategic calculation, emphasizing the need to allow de Sakes and Boudet divisions to occupy their positions. However, forced-hand accounts from participants revealed the precarious nature of the battle, with soldiers acknowledging the close calls and moments of uncertainty on the battlefield. Despite the challenges and complexities, the victory at Marengo provided Bonaparte with a powerful platform to further his ambitions and reshape the course of French history. The Museum of Marengo, known as the Emusio della Battaglia di Marengo, stands on Via della Barbata in Spinetta Marengo, Alessandria. Situated at the heart of where much of the fierce fighting between the French and Austrian armies occurred, the museum is housed within Villa de Levo, with its park enveloping the village of Marengo. In order to ensure that his triumph at Marengo would be remembered, Napoleon undertook various commemorative initiatives. Among these was the commissioning of General Chasselup to construct a pyramid at the battlefield site. On May 5, 1805, a solemn ceremony unfolded on the fields of Marengo. Napoleon, accompanied by Empress Josephine seated on a throne beneath a canopy, presided over a grand military parade. During this event, Chasselup presented Napoleon with the cornerstone of the pyramid, bearing the inscription, Napoleon, Emperor of the French and King of Italy, to the manes of the defenders of the fatherland who perished on the day of Marengo. This pyramid formed part of an ambitious project aimed at glorifying Bonaparte's conquests in Italy. The vision included transforming the field of Marengo into a city of victories, it with boulevards named after Italian battles converging towards the pyramid. However, the project was ultimately abandoned in 1815, with the stones reclaimed by local peasants. Although the column erected in 1801 was initially removed, it was later restored in 1922. Napoleon's desire to commemorate Marengo extended beyond monuments and landmarks. He directed that several ships of the French Navy be christened with the name Marengo, including notable vessels such as Scepter, 1780, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, 1795, Ville de Paris, 1851, and Marengo, 1810. Additionally, in 1802, a department in France was named Marengo in honor of the battle. Napoleon's own steed during the battle, named Marengo, faithfully carried him through subsequent conflicts at Austerlitz, Jena-Auerstedt, Wagram, and Waterloo. Even after Napoleon's downfall, the legacy of Marengo endured. Marengo County in Alabama, originally settled by Napoleonic refugees as part of the Vine and Olive Colony, was named in homage to the battle. Since then, numerous settlements across Canada and the United States have been christened Marengo. Today, the battlefield's memory lives on through the museum dedicated to the battle on the outskirts of Alessandria.
Annual reenactments are also organized to honor the historic event. Furthermore, the culinary world pays homage to Marengo with the dish Chicken Marengo, named in recognition of Napoleon's victory. Thank you for watching, and if you enjoyed this video, please subscribe and share it. Your support is greatly appreciated, and you can find details on how to support my channels through PayPal in the description box below.